I think is already happening is you'll see all these kind of like new art forms emerge out of like that kind of organic process, you know, and I think I think a lot of them are probably coming from open source, you know, or these maybe I'm, I'm obviously very biased, but I think there's the stuff that like I, I think where it's like, oh, that could be a new art form. They're mostly kind of like coming from um, this kind of space. And I think to me, um, that's kind of like, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of like interesting. So obviously, um, if, the, if there are people are making art, you know, that's kind of compelling um, and other people want to make it and there's tools that make it accessible, obviously there's kind of like money to be made from that in various forms, you know, and there's obviously companies who are um, interested in that. Uh, welcome to one more episode of Zero One Cast, a place where humans create and machines dream. Today we had uh, with us talk with uh, Pon, also no one's better, and uh, he he was the creator of this Bano Doko AI, which is pretty focused also on the open source AI community, like also our previous guest. And uh, yeah, Mauricio, what 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 your thoughts about this conversation? It was super pleasant conversation. It was such a happy, nice guy, right? <laughs> that was so nice. Yeah. And yeah, I've been a big, big fan of his work for a long time. He creates a lot of the tools that I use on my work daily basis. So it was a big pleasure to have him here. And he definitely shares some great ideas around AI, around ConfUI, around the open source community that really can, can inspire people. And I think some really great tips around how to start to pick a focus, get a mission, <laughs> otherwise yeah, you'll get, get crazy. Yeah, it was a great tip. So yeah, if you're interested on open source, AI, Conf UI, uh, you are on the, on the right episode for you and yeah, let's go. So welcome to one more episode of, of Zero One Cast. Uh, today we have with us Peter, also known as Bomb. And uh, yeah, on his Twitter, he described himself as working with a ragtag group of nerds to build a tiny piece of the second renaissance. And yeah, we are really excited for, from this conversation. Maurice also chatting with him for a long time. And yeah, let, let's go. So, so Pom or Peter, like before we, uh, maybe can you just give some like short intro about yourself or whatever, what you're doing in this world, anything you want, and then we start. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of an intro is, um, I, yeah, I kind of um, um, had, had been like involved in kind of um, kind of startups and innovation related things for quite a while. And then basically um, had around two or so years ago, you know, kind of got into the whole AI art stuff. And then I've just been very um, obsessed with that since and my background makes uh no sense. Uh, it's just not a queer uh, thread. I just found this like really, really exciting. It just couldn't stop uh, thinking about it. So I kind of uh, ended up here. So yeah. Right. Nice. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a rabbit hole, a rabbit hole. And we also there in some way, uh, me and Maurice also for, for almost two years, Maurice, I think even more than two years and me almost two years already. So yeah, like, but let's quick, before we talk about AI, let's quickly talk uh, so how was your routine? What how was your work routine, your creative routine before AI and, and how AI changed the way you're working in your creative routine? Yeah, like it's kind of like interesting. So I, I mostly did um, kind of um, marketing before, in particular kind of what's called like growth marketing, which is usually just kind of like somewhat technical and creative, uh, you know, marketing tactics and figuring out how to get like an advantage from uh, a kind of... Um, you know, customer acquisition perspective. And like one, one f funny thing about that was like a lot of what I would do in that whole world was um, basically like a, lo a lot of what like people do in marketing is that they do very generic um, approaches, you know, where they kind of just have one ad that targets all of the world. Whereas actually what I would do is I would basically kind of like um, hire, like just hire like a BPO firm. Is there people like uh, who are, you know, in um, India, these areas where they kind of have lots of data entry workers and get them to, for example, like write the copy for a thousand ads, you know, and do stuff like that. So the way I was kind of using, uh, you know, LLMs before they actually really existed. A lot of, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was kind of like doing lots of kind of like productivity stuff like that, that was basically trying to, you know, uh, you know, use intelligence or build structures on top of intelligence in ways to get advantages. 
but uh, but a lot of it, yeah, a lot of the, what I do, I, I obviously felt like I, um, I think a lot of people in AI are kind of like ideas guys, you know, who are, who are, who are loving it because all of a sudden they're able to actually make their ideas a reality. And I was definitely more of an ideas guy. And I think thanks to AI, I've managed to become more of an actual reality person, you know, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden I was able to like, you know, make art way better and, you know, code way better and even like write way better. And I think a lot of it was like, I was trying to do all these things before, but I was like held back by my own competence and lack of focus. And uh, AI, having AI basically um, allowed me to actually do them um, properly. So that was basically like the big thing. It actually allowed me to kind of like try all these different things at once, try to actually do hopefully some of them well, pretty well at times. <laughs> Interesting, very really nice story. It, yeah, talking about ideas, there's this whole discussion if AI kills creativity or if AI expands creativity. So what what do you think about this? Does it kill, does it expand, depends how you use, what do you think about it? Yeah, like how, how I see it, I'm, I'm obviously very involved in the whole video space and I kind of see there's like two broad tracks that are happening and like one in my mind is very dystopian and one is very utopian and the one is this path that leads us towards like what I call like auto AI auto generated TikTok, you know, where you're like looking at your phone and it's tracking your pulse and like how your eyes respond to things and like your brain waves even. And it's just showing you all you need to, it needs to show you to keep you watching, you know, because that's their business model. And then you, you see, when you kind of like think about as that as like a cultural and technological development, you kind of like realize that, for example, like, um, creative tools that don't offer much control like they're like a building block towards that you know if you're able to like only generate like you know a minute worth of footage for example and that's all you can just give a short prompt there's just not enough context there for that to be a really good creative tool and therefore it's kind of a tool that's going to contribute to that kind of uh world and um then on the other side there's um the kind of like this is what, what, I, what I meant to my Twitter by about the second renaissance. There's this world where the tools of creativity powered by AI kind of become so good that there's so many different control mechanisms over them. There's so many different subcultures using them. And there's so many different kind of, um, you know, new art forms to develop that there's like everyone in the world has like a, a tool of or a form or a media or a culture of creative expression. And as a result, the whole world goes to the actual opposite direction to that, that like there's billions of people creating art and they're not only creating art that's meant to just keep you watching, but art that's meant to like challenge you and make you feel stuff and, you know, and maybe make you question yourself and make you do all these things that TikTok wouldn't want you to do because, you know, there's more to the human experience than just keeping your eyes glued to a screen. Yeah, 100%, man, I agree with that. And I I don't remember who tell me this, but I, I agree until today, which is like the, the kind of purpose of art, you know, it's supposed to comfort the disturbed and disturb yeah. the comfortable people. <laughs> and I <laughs> yeah. love that, that quote. I think it, it, it encapsulates a lot of what I see uh, yeah. of art. Uh, well, man, I'm a big fan of your, your work, especially on Banodoko, uh, both the company and the, and the community. So what can you tell us more in depth about the company side of Bonodoco, like how the idea came up, what are the struggles and what, what you like most of it as, as a company? Yeah, like, well, well, basically it kind of started around um, two or so years ago when uh, like a uh, long story short was I basically um, wanted to make a kind of video for this poem that I really, really like. And basically was trying to use all the existing tools to do that, but lots of them for loads of different reasons weren't good enough. And I basically started to kind of like build my own tool on top of open source technology that basically was trying to be like a video tool that you could control with precision. And then basically um, I, I was like really like uh, struggling to do this uh, uh, because I just like lacked the technical skills. I lacked the kind of like ability to kind of like really understand what was going on. The AI models I'd never really made art before. So I was like, hopelessly um, incompetent in almost like every uh, everything I was trying to do and I was trying to do it all at once. And around this time, I don't know if you guys spent much time in the Stable Diffusion subreddit, but basically, you know, around two or so years ago, a year and a half ago, this is this place that it was like the most exciting place in the world for like a certain class of nerd. 
<laughs> where um, you'd basically go there and every day you'd kind of like refresh and you'd see some like new exciting thing that someone had figured out on top of stable diffusion or some, you know, new control net or new control method or new kind of way of prompting. And it was basically like this kind of like looking glass into this whole new world that was emerging of the whole AI art scene. And, and, and but, but at the same time, it was also, you know, teenage boys, you know, posting their waifu dancing pictures, you know, and like people didn't really have much of an appreciation for art, you know, people who were, you know, you know, the top voted things were often just kind of like a, a woman, you know, with, you know, her like nipples visible through her top dancing. And that was what people like, you know, liked, but there was something really uh, magical about it. And, and basically around um, a year or yeah, a little over a year ago or so, um, I kind of like had a new model had come out, Animate Diff, and I kind of had thought that like there was something really, really good about the Stable Diffusion subreddit, but then there was also lots that was very poisonous and toxic about it. And I, I wanted to kind of like try to build a community that was like the best of that, you know, that was like the technical people who are kind of like pushing things and who, who kind of are trying to kind of like make stuff and people who appreciate the work that they're doing and that people who use the work that they're doing to actually like try to create art, you know, and some of that's obviously still dancing girls, but then a lot of it is, you know, people trying to express themselves or trying to, you know, show things or trying to push themselves in terms of what they create. And, and, and that's kind of um, how the community came to be, that it was basically just me trying to kind of like cap both capture this kind of like really like utopian element of the Stable Diffusion subreddit but then also to hopefully by, you know, having all this community who works together to kind of like um, yeah, be kind of more um, productive and, and to kind of like better organized and for the technical people to actually like know what's going on from an artistic side, know what they need. And hopefully, you know, through the osmosis of that, then all these tools that people like me who, you know, aren't very technically competent, but love to use stuff that the people have built are able to kind of like um, build on top of basically. So yeah, it was basically just trying to, capture that um, <laughs> magic uh, of the open, early open source movement and kind of like trying to like help that work better and, and try to help, the, you know, encourage the people in it and, you know, help them be appreciated and all this kind of uh, thing basically was the whole goal behind it. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I've never been much a fan of Reddit, but I know that a lot of things happen in there. But it can more... be, I was also thinking, I use it for, I don't know, eight years or something, I don't know, but this, it can be very useful or very toxic, I think that, <laughs> yeah. that's a good description. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, so one of your more, most known work is the steerable motion, though, workflow technology bot yeah. site, uh, which basically takes the old Disney animation style of things, which is frame by frame sequence and interpolate between them. Yeah. They do it by hand back then, <laughs> but we, we, you find a way to do it digitally. So tell us a little bit about it. How, how was the idea to, to do it and how was the development, the current states, and if you have any next steps you can share with us? Yeah, like what, what basically the, the whole idea behind that was, um, <laughs> I think it was when I was, um, when I was building my tool, I kept on trying different um, control methods for it. And like, it was actually like a video to video tool to start. But basically I was kind of like, uh, what annoyed me about video to video is I had to like go outside and like record things and to be, you know, do all this kind of stuff. And then like, what annoyed me about prompting was that you didn't have enough control. And basically I was like, oh, if you could just use images to guide it, that would be like way better. But I actually didn't, uh, I was very ignorant to how, you know, how the whole animation studio works. So I wasn't actually even aware at this time that this is how everything works, but I, I kind of came to the conclusion that this would be the the best way, but also not just because, I don't know if you use serve emotion much, but not, not just because you can travel from images to images, but for example, you can actually just like um, use images on like very low guidance and just like, you know, you know, use it kind of like a, drive the, the overall idea of a thing without it being too precise, or you can you control how fast it moves between images, you control how you know big the gap is, and you can control all these different mechanisms that they have this kind of um, downstream impact on how the animation looks. And it just felt like, you know, gi given all this control you could have, then basically um, it felt, and you can generate images really, really fast, you know, so with LCM, you can generate like an image a second. Uh, that if you could like do this and it felt like it'd be the best kind of like natural way to actually 
control AI. And yeah, like now I actually, it, it's kind of like reached a point that where I wasn't very happy with it for a long time, but it's actually reached a point where now it feels like uh, good. Uh, the animations certainly look uh, pretty good, but it's obviously very limited in loads of ways. Uh, but the, firstly, from like a control perspective, you can kind of like control lots about how the frame is moved, but then there's lots of other elements of control. Like for example, like how the motion happens inside of it. Like say if, if you move from the you know, this square to this square, like what parts of it move? How do they kind of, you know, transform into each other? What, what kind of melts and what kind of like tries to make the transition? And basically a, a lot of it was, you know, there's, there's like a few problems with it that one is just that the base model that it's working on is just like too weak, you know, that it doesn't have like a, strong enough um, sense of motion, you know, to actually like do like complex transitions. And the secondly, the the amount of context it sees. So currently Animate Diff, which is based on only sees 16 frames of concept, of context. So when you think about like how much movement can even happen in 16 frames, you know, that's that it's not a lot basically. And then another problem with it is that it's just not actually even trained for the task that it's doing. Like if you actually look at the code of um, serve motion, it's just like, there's actually, I think like some like seven models hacked together just to, to, to make it work. And uh, that, that, that kind of like works, but it's, it's obviously like, uh, you know, limited in loads of ways. So like actually what, what we're doing um, now, um, um, what, or more specifically uh, guy um, Ian Gallagher, who's uh, working uh, uh, with me is basically um, he's working like a more advanced kind of base model for serial motion um, that will make the motion like way better and way more realistic. And then also another model that will be, uh, they'll work on top of it. That's actually like, trained specifically for the task of uh, motion uh, or moving between images. So that means it will just kind of like have a way better idea of how that kind of motion happens and actually be trained for the task. And then there'll be lots of other stuff on top of it that will, for example, like allow you to draw on top of it in order to say where you want the motion of the image to happen, you know? So if you have a, a, a woman's head here and you have like, you want her to turn this way, but you don't want the background to move, you'll be able to like either automatically specify that or kind of um, basically uh, draw it, you know, based on like different specifications. And, and that's... Uh, Thanks to the work of um, this guy from the Discord, uh, Super Beasts or Brad, um, and that's hopefully going to be implemented into Doe, the tool uh, that uh, yeah, the tool that basically is for th delivering servo motion. But uh, yeah, so there's not, hopefully lots more coming uh, <laughs> very soon. That's awesome, man. Really excited about that. They use it a lot. Uh, I think you, you point out some really interesting things, like especially in the beginning about like you kind of had to discover what AI could do and could not do. And like from there, start to building things. So it's, it, it's like a relationship of, of building the things with AI actually, and be not fully in control, but trying to like tame the beast a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I'm really happy to hear about the models because for me, it, it's what's making the biggest difference. Like what Loom and Runaway have compared to the open yeah. source model is a gigantic difference in the model training and the, the amount of data that was was been using in that. So really happy to hear that we'll have some some new models. I was super happy that today I could get like 48 frames of fully concise animation in Dynamic Crafter from Kijai. It's like, yeah, finally. <laughs> nice. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's been like, a, it's, a, it's a fight of days to build the whole thing and you, you've been building for, for months. So it's, it's quite yeah. interesting. And like about the Banadoko community, for me, is one of the biggest and best places to learn about AI, especially open source AI and Conf UI. And this relationship that you just described, like someone from the Discord server helped you improve the tool. And everybody there is, it has this mentality, right? Of, of like, let me test this, let me see what, what I can give a feedback, let me see how we can together improve the, the whole technology and make it available to everyone. So the, the whole feeling of the community is really nice. It's a really nice place to, to be part of. How much time do you spend on the, on the Discord server? And did you expect to like grow that much? I think we have like more than 10 K people in there. Yeah. Like, well, I'd say, I'd say that, um, 
I wasn't sure if it would grow that much because I didn't actually only advertised it like a couple of times at the beginning, you know, and it had like a few posts on Reddit. And other than that, it's been like fairly like organic. But um, yeah, like I, I, I don't know. I, I, I spend I spend pretty much all day uh, there because I just like love this stuff and I'm like constantly trying to understand, you know, all the different things that's happening and how they all apply and, you know, trying to, you know, uh, not go crazy while doing that because <laughs> it's a lot of it's very distracting. Yeah, but, but I like, I really love it. And I think it's kind of like, it's exactly what I wanted to exist in the world. And it's kind of like, uh, yeah, I think it is kind of like uh, very like utopian in many ways that like, you know, in a very in like this dystopia is again, that kind of thing where everyone's like, if imagine for in a post-scarcity future, no one has to work. And it's, I think it'd be really depressing for people to not want to do anything. But I think what would be uh, really kind of good is if, if people kind of like get together and it's like, work voluntarily on stuff that's important to them and stuff that they care about. And there's so many people uh, in the community who are just kind of like uh, doing that, you know, and doing their spare time just because they kind of care about it and because they think it's good for the world. And I think to me, that's kind of, um, and I think it gives people like a lot of uh, um, that, like is obviously like challenging a lot of the time, you know, like uh, if you're kind of like, you know, debugging bugs or if you get like someone who's, uh, very unappreciative of the stuff you've done or people like treating you like a customer help desk, you know, when they have a bug with your kind of uh, software, it's obviously not nice, but I think a lot of it is that like, that there's so many people who are, who are kind of like, not really put up with that, but people who are just like really like endlessly patient in spite of all that. And who are kind of like, not just that, but they're doing kind of really uh, brilliant technical work. And a lot of the time they're people who have like, absolutely like uh no backgrounds you know like i don't know you probably know like people like kajai for example and he's he's done like nothing technical before and now he's kind of like constantly making really really good things and like putting in lots of effort and making you know everything he does is pretty much just very like thoughtful and very you know driven and it's the same with like uh someone like mateo or kazinka or any of these kind of people they're basically uh most of them don't really have a background in anything related to machine learning, but a lot of them are just doing stuff that because they just learned and they push themselves and because they, you know, um, you know, stayed motivated, they're kind of able to do this kind of like really good uh, and impactful work. And, uh, yeah, I, th I think that to me, that's uh, really cool. And I think it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I think that uh, that's if, you know, more people, I think more pe like, you know, if, if like a lot of people, for example, have, powerful GPUs because of like uh, gaming, you know, that they're, they kind of played lots of video games before. And I think that's like, obviously like fine, but I think there's something like, uh, I think a lot, if, if you're spending that same GPU time creating things and you're spending the kind of like intellectual effort that you could be solving some in-game puzzle and something that's going to be useful to other people, like that feels <laughs> like a lot more uh, of a good and wholesome outlet for your time, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, but obviously at the end of the day, it's like lots of people are working for free. Lots of people are doing loads and loads of work uh, for free. And I think that's kind of like, um, you know, part of the challenge is to kind of like, uh, you know, make it sustainable for those people and actually make them rewarded for it. And also that, you know, lots of people in the community, you know, um, obviously, as you said, like there's some people who come in and take workflows, but there's also lots of other people who, who like for, for, for lots of reasons, um, you know, um, don't um, kind of like, um, you know, they just take stuff and don't give anything back, you know. And to me, that's kind of, um, I think the whole thing is like an ecosystem that it's not like, a, you know, like say if a, a company, for example, is like this kind of um, hierarchical, um, you know, human form, a like community, or like this is more like a, a natural ecosystem where like things, you know, grow in one area that causes something else to grow. Then, you know, something comes in that, that you know, uh, eats off that but then that gets you know taken by that and a lot of it is this kind of like organic system and i think in a way everyone who's there is kind of like part of that and it just lots of people who like for example like learn stuff or make something or push things forward have a variance in the workflow and i think the more people feed back into the thing that they take from even companies and individuals that the, the more it'll kind of like grow and the more it'll be like healthier and i think to me that's uh that's like the most important thing and i think it's kind of um 
yeah, it's kind of, it's very hard to it's very hard to manage that because it's like I I kind of have a, I I obviously stare at the community, but I basically have like no real power because it's high, it's anarchical, you know, that everyone is ultimately doing whatever they want, and, and I can't I can't um, I I'll never be able to tell anyone to do anything, you know, because that's the nature of it. But um, and then we have to change anyone's behavior in any meaningful way, except maybe like inspire them. But that I think uh, in the way it's uh, trying to channel it, try to you know re- reward people and stuff. But it's very uh, yeah, it's very it's it's very interesting. It's, it's such a unique uh, thing. <laughs> no, definitely a community is a, is a living organism, right? Like I just said, something is growing, something is dying, something is changing. People people come and go, and yeah, there's this organic of it, and. So yeah, like talking a bit about AI and tech. So, what are your like your favorite uh, technologies on the on the landscape? I don't know. Maybe it can be like a, a Confuai workflow, or maybe some technology you really like enjoying playing. And uh, yeah, like in like on Confuai, what are the best nodes and things that you can do with it? There's anything that you highlight that you that you like? In terms of tools, like other AI tools, I actually like. What I think my, one of my favorite things is. Um... I don't really like working with tools where it's like lots kind of in the way, like in between you and the model where they kind of like make lots of decisions and a lot of them just aren't like good decisions, you know, in terms of how you can interact with things. So like, I I think one of my favorite things is actually just talking to um, models without any filter, you know, for example, you could, you could like use um, Llama without um, any instruction fine tuning. So it's basically just kind of, uh, uh, you know, putting in text uh, without it actually even knowing, without it even trying to respond to you. It just kind of continues whatever text you put in. And uh, that's kind of, uh, but it's also, it's it still has the same kind of raw intelligence that you see when um, you kind of um, use um, the instruction fine tuned models like ChatGPT, but it's like very, uh, it's very, in a very, very different form, you know, so it doesn't have any kind of, uh, idea that it's kind of um, it's, supposed, it's supposed to act like a person it just kind of like continues whatever you write it so you can kind of put in crazy things and you can put in like a lot of examples of things you know and it, it continues whatever you write so it's really good for um, like creativity but a lot of it is you have to um, you can get like really genuinely like original uh, like ideas out of it but a lot of it is you have to put in like because it doesn't it's not even trying to answer your question you have to put in like 20, you have to just keep on running it over and over again and then kind of like pick up on some idea. But it, it feels like it's like the, you know, chat GPT feels like you're talking to like a, I don't know, it's like a, um, a lobotomized robot that's kind of, um, you know, knows everything. Whereas this kind of feels like you're you're um, interacting with the whole uh, collective consciousness of like humankind or something. So it's, it's just that random, you know, and if you put in a few Arab characters will contribute. It will continue something if you put in random letters. You know, if you put in quotes, it basically is just kind of like really chaotic. So I think like that's probably my favorite thing to do from an actual um, AI perspective. Uh, even though I, I can't really, let, I, I get too distracted by it, so I, I try to avoid it unless there's actually like a purpose. Uh, but in terms of Kofi, I, I think my favorite thing lately, anyway, has actually just been. Um, all the IP adapter stuff um, for like generating images um, that basically I, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, but there's uh, there's there's basically like a, a, a few models and a few kind of stuff that uh, that uh, Osteris has uh, created, and then there's uh, all the stuff that uh, Matteo has made for kind of controlling the style of an image and the composition of an image and the overall kind of feeling of it uh, independently of one another. So you can basically like give multiple different images to it and then mash them up in all different ways. And I basically, I built a tool into Doe, the kind of like artistic tool that I built that basically lets you kind of like use an LLM to generate random prompts. And then that that prompts IP adapter based on different um, images that you give to it that are can be like chaotic or weird. And you can kind of control the structure, composition, the style, and then the prompts all independently and have them all AI generated. So you can just generate thousands of images that are just all really weird related to a theme that can be kept consistent enough that they're like useful. You know, this this been part of this um, art tool that I've been building. It's like one of the, it, the most important parts of it in terms of like being a creative partner to you. But um, so that's probably IP adapters has been where I've been spending like most of my time lately, but it's, it's uh, not, it's not very uh, 
basically, yeah. It's it's kind of like boring relative to lots of the stuff that other people do. There's like all like insanely talented people in the in the kind of like Discord who are building these like really crazy workflows. So I, I guess you probably saw those sort of people like um MGFXer who he does all these kind of um interactions where you basically kind of um um uh can specify kind of like masks to guide the animations so for example like it it, it it's it moves it has a an image guiding the animation then it like pushes that from the left or pushes that from the center and it kind of creates all these like really um interesting effects you know and then there's all other people like uh like jack g and syncratic who are doing all these kind of like audio reactive workflows and basically it's kind of like just you know right now in animate diff world people are really good at kind of like controlling images and across like multiple layers you know so based on like depth and uh, guiding them in all these different ways so based on like sounds um you know video uh, like uh, motion you know where in the movie where the video moves and all these like crazy vectors of control and, and people like kazinka think of you know exposed loads of these different settings inside animate if that guide how it moves and, and basically just people just combine all of these and all these kind of like crazy ways to kind of like, you know, uh, just create really uh, <laughs> unusual things that like don't, they don't like, there's lots of AI art that's just kind of random. And I don't really find that interesting because it's just like anyone can create random stuff these days. But there's people who basically are using uh, their randomness in like really interesting ways and they're kind of like controlling things enough that they feel coherent, but then like still um, kind of um, basically, uh, you know, it still looks kind of um, interesting and crazy and weird, but also is, uh, you know, not so chaotic that it's it's uh, incoherent, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. It, it's very interesting. That, and yeah, I think AI art will also mature and evolve as like, a, and is as its own thing, like this kind yeah. of stuff, like exploring the randomness or exploring like maybe gaps of the model or whatever that is like, non-obvious uh, like or original or something something new created with this right yeah yeah allows to create something that it was never been possible to done be done before, before. that's yeah. that's the interesting part for yeah a, a lot of it is what, what she said there that a lot of it needs to kind of like mature artistically that, that I, like for example like um d forum is like two or so years old you know but now like you kind of like see people who are really good at using that in like a really like refined way yeah and and, and people who kind of like use that because the beginning ones deform and generates images frame by frame and mm -hmm. basically kind of like keeps them somewhat coherent for people that don't know but basically um uh, before people just use that for like these, you know, they create like a five minute generation where it's just all going all crazy places. But now people like use it like this really artistically interesting way because it's matured so much and people yeah, have with like- more, with more have, purpose yeah. and, and yeah. Comes, yeah. yeah. And exactly. they've had time to think about it and think about its weirdness and its quirks. And I think this, yeah. it's it's like a, a baby growing up that I think this stuff just needs time, you know, and it needs kind of like, um, you know, people to stay interested and to stay pushing themselves artistically. But then I think like, you see lots of stuff uh, in lots of places that, you know, it's just not very, it's how people, people have really good ideas, but it just needs to be cooked for like, you know, as a culture for six more months. And then with that, that the version of that idea in six months will be amazing, you know? And I think, but right now, if I show it to you, you'll probably be like, what is that? But it's like, you need to, you know, give it time to mature. People need to stick with it to revisit it basically. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, but I, I, yeah, I think also the, the AI video and the AI image, and also I think like when you facilitate also the production of the, the images and the videos, like there will be a lot of people doing it and there will also need a lot of curation on this, on this content because yeah, yeah, do you reduce the barrier, the barrier, but I think the curation also, it's very, very important. Just quickly again, t touching on the, on the, on the Confi UI topic as you know it's not so easy to to start with confi ui it can be quite yeah. complex uh, sure depending what you do so for you what are like the biggest challenge on the trying to increase the adoption of, of confi ui uh like to reduce this friction also like to start with open source and confi ui and do you have any recommendation for for anyone who's want to start or is struggling or something like that yeah, well, I think like uh, the, the tricky thing with Comfy UI is that it's it's kind of one of these things where it's it's almost like necessarily difficult <laughs> in a way that a lot of it is like what you're trying to do with it is 
kind of difficult, you know, that you're trying to figure out how to combine all these models in, in different ways. And you have to like have this understanding of how they all work and you have to like, you know, you, you kind of have to struggle to figure out that, but then there's obviously like stuff where it kind of, it can be too frictional in, in many ways. So, uh, you know, for example, like when you load a new workflow and you have to figure out what all the models are, or if you had to like install lots of dependencies, but, but I think, and then the, the, there's elements of the UX that are very confusing, uh, even 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 considering that you know it shouldn't be an easy tool to, tool to use. But I think thankfully the Comfy Org team, I think, are actually they're very. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but the 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 guys behind the Comfy and on the guy behind it uh, um, joined uh, joined the company that basically is working to kind of like um, advance Comfy as a tool and as an ecosystem. And I have a feeling that like they're going to solve a lot of the the problems around accessibility. And I think um, a lot of it is also that, you know, you obviously need a GPU to run Comfy and that <laughs> scares away, <laughs> you know, a few hundred million people. But I think there's there's like lots of um, like those kind of things that will just make it as a tool way more accessible. But then I, I think a lot of it is that like um, Comfy is like, um, it's kind of like a, a UX and it's a tool built for the purpose of tinkering and experimenting. So a lot of it has this very powerful capabilities, but the workflow that you actually use to use these capabilities is like not really driven for like the creative process where you like need to kind of like see lots of information in a particular context. You need to kind of like be able to iterate. You need to be able to like, you know, <coughs> combine things in different ways. You need to have like a, a basic workflow built on top of it and tools that are made for this workflow. And, um, I would say, like over time, Comfy will probably like add uh, lots of uh, capabilities to enable that. But I think at the end of the day, like um, a creative tool is something that, like you know, is, you know, and hopefully in AI, we have lots of weird, opinionated, creative tools where people have these kind of like crazy ideas of how you know you can use you know lots of these capabilities available inside Comfy to kind of achieve a particular purpose. And I and I think what would be amazing is if um, you know five years from now, there's like thousands of creative tools that are all based on these different opinions. And that's what I hope to help uh, uh, make happen that, you know, that if you have an idea for a creative tool to build on top of Comfy, that you're able to kind of like bring that to the world that could have your own weird opinions. Those opinions could be wrong or they could be right, you know, but uh, you know, that you know, hopefully they enable again, like maybe even a few thousand more people to embrace creativity. And I think, Comfy and open source, the benefit of it is just being maximally weird because there's no constraints on like weirdness. And I think, you know, the more people are able to kind of like share their idea, their weird ideas and spread them and, you know, build cultures around them. I think the better off, uh, you know, the whole ecosystem will be because the, I think the more people that are creating with this stuff, the, you know, the more excitement and energy comes and money and all these kind of things comes into the ecosystem. And if people could do that in a way that's um, open friendly, you know, uh, an open source friendly, or even benefits from being open source, then I think that will just lead to the whole ecosystem thriving more. So, yeah. So I hope there's like thousands of tools basically uh, that are built on top of the stuff Comfy enables uh, that never would have come into existence through Comfy. And, you know, that, uh, that Comfy itself is like, the best of what it can be, but that, you know, it kind of uh, enables, you know, so much more to happen because it's it's both a tool and infrastructure at the same time, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's like a, a white tool that you can build programs with it that do something. It's, it's, it's really crazy. The first time yeah, I yeah. see it, it's like, and I came from 3D world, so I'm more than used to the nodes thing, but yeah. even there is like, how many parameters in just one thing to, to tackle, but yeah. it's definitely becoming more and more interesting and more than play with it. You start to understand it and it, it becomes quite intuitive, like how to plug in nodes. It has a lot of super nice things like, oh, things got to take lost opacity if you can plug it. So you, you, you see clearly that you cannot link in there like, oh, the yeah. error showcase a red line around it. Like, it's really clear the things that so we, we need to start to pay attention yeah, to but it. Yeah, imagine, it imagine if it's Comfy Why there is this <laughs> bot there, and then I just go there and I say, ah, I, I need to do this, this, and that. And then on the background, he'll say, okay, you need this and this and this. And then he will poof, connect for me, and I will like use it. And But I think also like 
imagine this like Confi Weimar user friend. I think, as you said, like it, there's this necessary complexity, right? And, and this also gives a lot of like creative uh, freedom and experimentation as well for Confi Y and control, of course. Uh, yeah. But on the other hand, it will also be nice to have this like simple version and the advanced version or something that you will there. You have the maybe the models or even based on like jobs to be done. Okay, I need to do this or I need to do that. And then on the background, he will load all the models or the nodes and, you know, this more like a uh, user-friendly version, but still keeping the totally uh, nodes version for people who are advanced users, for example, I think would be a nice, nice solution. Yeah. Yeah. The platforms kind of does that, you know, pack, get, get the workflow and do that, but it will be interesting to have like a GPT super specializing config that can help you yeah. inside yeah. of it. Good idea. Maybe it's a good, it's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, man, let's talk about the people that inspire you. Like, what's your favorite AI artists, conf users or not? And outside of the AI world, like, who inspires you? Can be, I don't know, singer, writer, philosopher, whatever. Yeah, well, I have like um, so many uh, favorite um, AI artists. That I almost don't want to mention people because um, you know I probably just forget some. But but I think there's like there's there's like a uh, so many people like I guess going back to your other question, I think what people like what what I love in like artists is people who are doing one of two things is these people who are just put in like an insane amount of um, effort and an insane amount of care into what they're doing. Um, and there are people you know like who are you know directors, for example, like people like Paul Thomas Anderson or kind of like Stanley Kubrick, who kind of you know have this like very precise idea of what they want to do, and then they just like never stop until they reach it, you know. And I think, because I think to me, that's like this like very um, aspirational idea of what like, uh, you know, uh, this kind of person should be, that they basically have this idea in their mind and they're kind of like, um, you know, not willing to settle on a lesser version of it until they realize it, you know. And I think just, I don't, I don't, even, I don't even want to mention artists because I feel like I'm probably going to forget people, but there's, there's like so many people who kind of like have done, who are, who are on the, the path to doing that. There's like, there's so many people, even in our Discord, for example, who, you know, have been kind of like just relentlessly kind of like pursuing that um, for, for so long and like every day almost or every few days you see like a new project for them. I'm just, I'm just picking like one, uh, two people off the top of my head because I just saw posts by them, but there's people like um, Enigmatic E, I don't know if you guys know him, and Chris Chris.exe, and, and these guys are just like, these people who are just like, constantly pushing for this level and uh, who are kind of like really trying to basically like make something really um, exceptional. And I think to me, that's kind of like just this kind of um, really kind of um, admirable uh, pursuit, you know, of just, not, you know, trying to just uh, as hard as you can to make it as good as possible. And then I think there's, um, you know, another aspect of it where there's people who are actually really trying to, uh, I don't know, like bear their soul, you know, and they really, um, they kind of uh, really want to kind of like uh, express themselves and like and share the stories that they have and share these kind of like um, ideas that they have and try to do that in like a beautiful way. And I think there's there's almost like the there's there's, there's like um, yeah that's almost like an, a, an almost like separate thing. And I think I have lots of like artists who I kind of like love to do that. Like people like um, Leonard Cohen, for example, he's one of my favorite singers. And he's not even, he's like a very like famous singer, is very talented as a songwriter, but he actually, in most of his songs, he only uses like six chords, you know, in his guitar. Like very... His melodies are very similar, even across other albums. Yeah, and, um... yeah. And, and, he, and he told a story about it, but he's like, he's not even a very talented guitarist, you know, but the, there's this like, and I think there's artists who are kind of like pursuing that where they're basically, you know, you know, trying to, um, kind of, um, you know, tell stories and kind of like express ideas that are, you know, uh, even if they're not, uh, even if they're not kind of like the people who are going like mega deep into kind of um, comfy or going into, you know, who know what every note does, but they're kind of like people who are just um, um, trying to basically express kind of feelings and express like, um, um, you know, um, ideas and tell stories. And I think to me, that's like a whole other um that's a whole other aspect that I think a lot of it is that, um, yeah, I think both of those are kind of, um, you know, people I admire in the attritional art world, the people who are admire in the AI art world. And then I think there's just lots of people who are just like relentlessly uh, trying and, and as somebody who's like a, a, a try hard, 
you know, your people that are just trying to push it further and trying to get better. And I think there's like, there's so many people I, I think who, um, you know, like a lot of the times, you know, people like these, just some artists who you see like really um, amazing stuff from them. And I think there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, uh, start creating and they kind of like see amazing things and they're almost like um, demoralized uh, by it. I get the feeling. And I, I've chatted to some of these people that I've like complimented people on their work and they've been like, oh, yeah, it's, it's shit compared to this person. But at the end of the day, like that. Um, uh, as a friend of mine, um, uh, Ronan B, and one of the things he says is like, if you're creating art um, and you're expecting to make something good first time, it's like uh, going to the gym and expecting to like bench, you know, you know, 300 kilos. And it's like, that's just not how it works. It's like, you kind of have to struggle through it for a really, really long time. And you have to kind of like, create really embarrassing things, you know, and, and like, I, I, I've done this myself that I, like, I, I had all these like really terrible things that I made over the past two years. And I was like, didn't even want to publish them, but I was like, I want to actually do that because I hope that someday I'm making good stuff. And then, then I'll be able to let me, like, you know, point to that and show how terrible it is. But it's like, I think everyone needs to kind of like realize that, that it's like, even the whole technical aspect of figuring out, you know, how to kind of like, you know, guide someone's emotions, how to kind of like use uh, color, how to kind of like use sound, how to do all this kind of stuff. And even how what story you have to tell, what do you even want people to feel? Like what's even like worth sharing? What do you, what do you then to think about you based on what you make? And I think it's like, that's like a long journey. And it's like, you know, even people who are very technical talented, technically talented are only starting the the journey of like what do they actually want to say and then there's lots of people who are mm -hmm. very good at saying things but they just don't know how to uh basically uh you know express their ideas but all those things take uh, a very very uh long time and i think it's basically uh yeah it's totally. uh, it's like when yeah. you're a designer and you're like you're doing this for 10 years or 20 years and you look to your portfolio or the first works you do you say that's shit right and what that was it's normal it's like it's normal path and yeah it's, there's it's, more you do it more and I, I agree with you like again like and I, I think when the filmmaking it's very similar movement there's still this maturation and there's a lot of people who yeah they know the technical part they know how to make the films or to animate or even to use whatever but they are still missing the the, the storytelling or the cinematic yeah. or the and and yeah me myself also like learning a lot doing like AI films and I think I try to get a bit better in the, in the next one in the next one do something a bit better but also like learning more about this these aspects right it's not just about using the the tools uh, yeah I think a lot of it is also that um like and this is part of why I think um like uh should be basically a lot more uh you know lots of like traditional creative uh, industry people are afraid of uh they hate tools like runway and all these ones that take away a lot of control but i think the the good thing about comfy and other tools is that they basically are i think they're kind of like more familiar in terms of the amount of control that they have and i think these kinds of people who've already uh you know figured out this stuff in the domains will be like so far ahead in so many areas once they kind of um start um you know creating stuff with AI. And like one person I think of is my wife um, had a um, she had a summary she calls herself, but she basically, um, I, I basically built this tool for a long time with kind of like her in mind, the, um, this uh, tool toe, and I basically wanted to make it a really good tool for her. Uh, but, and I was expecting it to be like, oh, she's going to like really struggle to, to make something. She's like a really good uh, painter and visual communicator and has like really interesting ideas from a painting perspective. And I, and I thought like, it's going to take her like a long time to figure out how to use this tool. But then within like five hours, she'd made something that was like really uh, interesting and amazing, you know? And I think it was just because she had like trained this general skill of, you know, visually expressing herself and then could have and had even ideas for stuff that she wanted to express in video that she wasn't able to because she was already thinking in that way. And then when she came into this new world with this new tool, she was like way ahead of someone who'd never like done that work before. And I think, there's so many people who are out there who are kind of like, you know, existing animators or illustrators. And they've just, for example, like been in the uh, image space, you know, where they would take them half a day to draw a single image. And they kind of have this uh, potential to leap forward into like a higher fidelity medium. But they're obviously like, scared or afraid of it or don't like it for loads of different reasons, you know. But I think the more of those people can be like welcomed in, you know, uh, 
and uh, which is why I love when I ever see someone in, who joins our Discord who's kind of um, you know has an illustration background or has a three D background or because I, I know that these people are coming in and they're kind of like um, they kind of are you know in some respects like ahead but then in other respects like behind you know and I think but I think the stuff that they've learned is really valuable I think they'll hopefully be able to like uh, apply that to the spaces. Yeah, the yeah. people that already work with art, 3D illustration are the best, the people best equipped to use AI because they have all the knowledge that, that really improves the quality of the outcome, like that other people doesn't have. They didn't study, they didn't try and fail as much as these people did. So it's, yeah. it's interesting. You learn a lot of things by failing, right? Like, yeah, for yeah. me, it's the, the process of learning. <laughs> And, and talk, talking about art, do, do you do you think AI is creating this like this new like digital renaissance, this like explosion of content, image, video, media? So do do you really like believe that we are starting this like digital renaissance? And uh, how do you think that companies and open source will coexist on this renaissance creative world? Yeah, well, I, I'm obviously biased, but I, I kind of like think that. Uh, it is, and I think that to me, I think the the most exciting part of it is basically um, um, so there's like, for example, like um, when um, new art forms come out, for example, like anime, um, you know, doesn't look the, the stuff people make with anime, the themes that they do, how it looks visually, doesn't look anything like camera credit work, you know, because they're like two very different mediums, and people have to like figure out what makes sense given the constraints of like you know the hand drawn approach, and they. Uh, uh, or you know they uh, or they can try to kind of like you know for example in the case of like hand drawn they can try to like draw like uh, realism which is just like a very unnatural thing to do and I think to me what I what I kind of see now and I think it's an exciting thing there's lots of people who are trying to like replicate uh, cinema you know and um, who are a bit like this kind of I think what runway are going for where they're basically trying to make everyone into like a cinema like a, a cinematographer or whatever you call it, or a, a film director. But I think there's lots of other, you know, things that are basically like not trying to be anything, but are trying to figure out what they are, you know, or people have like tried this new thing or they have this new type of video and, and some of them end up spreading, you know, for example, and some of the other people end up kind of uh, copying them and other people end up having their own ideas on them. And like one example, this is kind of a little bit of a silly one, but you probably saw this whole like, food dancing um yeah trend lately that was started by Ger um, gertie and uh jay boogs they're they're both uh two really talented artists but basically that was just like that's like a little bit silly example because i don't think that's gonna last but like there's loads of like ideas like that that you know aren't gonna spread like as rapidly as that because that was kind of like a meme viral thing but they kind of like spread slowly where you, you see a video that someone makes so then you think about it for a few weeks and you're making this other project and you're like what if i did you know took that same idea but then applied it to this story you know and to me what will happen and what i think is already happening is you'll see all these kind of like new art forms emerge out of like that kind of organic process you know and i think i think a lot of them are probably coming from open source you know or these maybe i'm, I'm obviously very biased but i think there's this stuff that like i i think where it's like oh that could be a new art form they're mostly kind of like coming from um, this kind of space and i think to me um that's kind of like uh yeah i think that's kind of like interesting so obviously um if the, if there are people are making art you know that's kind of compelling um and other people want to make it and there's tools that make it accessible obviously there's kind of like money to be made from that in various forms you know and there's obviously companies who are um uh, interested in that and i think it's kind of like um the, the the problem right now is that you know a lot of these people who make money from it don't actually do it in a way that gives anything back to the ecosystem and i think that's obviously bad but I, but i hope that like as lots of these artists are kind of like making more stuff there'll be there'll be kind of like money that basically uh you know people want to like pay to go and see their work or live shows or they, they you know to see their next thing or they want to become patrons to them or companies want to kind of like help them bring their tools to market or bring their help other people equip other people to share their, um, you know, create art like they do. And I think hopefully there'll be like lots of kind of very like examples of that, hopefully from Panadoko as well, that enable people to do that in a way that's really kind of like nourishing to the ecosystem and, and helps everything happen. 
Uh, yeah, and I have to kind of like uh, more stuff happen in an open sense, you know, because the I think in my mind, the more things happening openly, the more, uh, yeah, it just brings more energy into everything and creates more excitement and, you know, <laughs> basically uh, gets more tools for nerds to uh, make it top. And what really makes me crazy is like, well, I understand why, but how investors don't focus on the open source community where the things are actually being developed, where the money will actually make way more difference than supporting these these platforms, which they basically pay for GPUs. Is, is that right? And for me, like I, I don't understand the how, you know, how they can do this and, and not really support something that will evolve a lot and, and help everybody. But we know why money, <laughs> as always, like right? they, they'll have the investment back and, and things like that. So it's it's a complicated scenario for sure, but I hope especially investors start to see the, the open source community as a source of uh, the place where the future will be built and not like this, this platform. Yeah. But well, I, I think a lot of it is that we're, we're in this kind of like novelty stage of things, you know, that where basically you can put up a new tool that like has something that like, is like an okay capability, you know, or an okay version of it that doesn't have like the right kind of controls or doesn't have like a lot of thought put into how it works. But because it's like this new thing, people are, will be like, oh, I want to try that. I want to generate something. And you'll see lots of people like come in and try it. But, th but then, you know, when you go through the novelty phase, it's like, it's going to still be the same thing as it always was, you know, which is artistic creation, you know. And that's ultimately the, 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 the novelty sellers. Try this new cool thing. But then the actual sellers like try to create art, you know. And that's something where it's like... um. We're the, I think it's just we're in this weird phase where, we're, where like most, for example, Silicon Valley investors, they don't like know what art is, you know, in a meaningful way. They've never tried to create art. They don't have like very like strong opinions on how it should work with AI. They don't really understand, you know, for example, like control is the most important thing and that, you know, all the open source people working in control who are, who are, you know, kind of obsessively working on something because they're trying to make a really good art project. The stuff that they produce is probably going to be better than like, what a product manager does. He's just kind of like doing it for a job. But I think it's like, I think it's like with all these things, they kind of like uh, take time, you know, that people have to like, we have to go through the novelty phase. And then, people, you know, once people are through that, then they realize, oh, you know, this is what this is. You know, it's, it's not kind of, um, it's not like, you know, it's not normal consumer behavior for people to just sign up to things to press a button that does nothing. They, they want to do something with it. Like, there's a purpose behind, you know, paintbrushes, you know, and there's a purpose behind everything. And like, ultimately what people will want is the tool that helps them fulfill that purpose, you know, the best. And, you know, and I think to me, that's kind of um, the, yeah, it's like we're in the weird uh, stage of it, you know, that it, it doesn't really, um, it's not mature basically in terms of like what people are doing. And even most people who are creating AI are actually like, they don't, uh, even myself, I don't really fully understand what you're doing with your credit card. Like, what are you, yeah, like what's kind of, uh, what's going on there? Like, why are you drawn to do it? Why do you want to do it? What, you know, why do other people want to do it? Why are people fascinated by other people's art? What's the difference between, you know, a three second clip that someone just, 10 second clip someone generated what, right away and a 10 second clip they put 100 hours into, you know, uh, how, how do consumers tell the difference? And I think they're all like, uh, you know, uh, questions that we're trying to figure out. And, yeah. Definitely. That is really like the baby steps of, of, of it. Like the beta version of the technology is yeah. still, so it's, it's a lot to, to evolve for sure. But, but I think, as you said, the humans want to be part of it, like an active part of it, not just go there and press a button. I remember yeah. of the story of like in the 60s, the, the box cakes become really famous, like get a boom. But short after the launch, they got a really big decline because the 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 woman that that used the the, the cakes they didn't feel they were putting effort with, it. so yeah. they literally changed the whole thing to add more ingredients. Before it was like, oh yeah, put, yeah. put milk, mix it, it's done. And then they like, oh no, put an egg, put sugar, blah, 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 just to make them feel part of the process. You know, it yeah, was yeah. not necessary, but like you need to to create this adoption for people to. Still part yeah. of it really interact with yeah. it. Yeah. And I think that's that's the same with everything that however whatever I think is easy, there'll be people who try who want the, the, the most difficult version of it, you know, and want to like push it to the limit, you know. And I think to me that's like uh what's gonna happen all of this century that there'll be things that become easy that were once hard. 
but that you'll just continue to push bigger and bigger in terms of like what you're making and how you're doing it and all that kind of stuff, you know. 100%, 100%. We're getting to the end of, of the podcast. We have some three, three more questions. Uh, what one needs to learn to be able to understand a little bit better ConfiUI and to start building some basic nodes, for example? Yeah, I, I think it's kind of like um, the hard thing is you kind of like... Um, it's going to be like a lot of uh, pain and it's like uh, suffering no matter what and a lot of like struggle. And to me, it's like, I think uh, it's very hard to like, uh, I think it'd be very hard to have like a comfy course, for example, like they kind of like need a reason to actually like go through it. So I, I basically say that like, all you actually need is like a reason, like something you want to make or like some, you know, for example, you want to like, you know, work in the space or you need to have like something you actually want to do. And like a lot of it is that there's so much to learn, like just like thousands of models. There's like probably like thousands of different nodes at this point that if you just try to like learn about something without a purpose, there's, it's like, there's, there's no way to do it because it's just, there's just so much and it's so chaotic and it's increasing every day. It's increasing faster than you could learn. So I think if you That's just have a like a, yeah. a purpose of what you want to do, you know, at, at, an idea of what you want to do, and then it's like, a lot of time you don't need to make a node because someone else has made it, but then a lot of time you do because like no one else was taught to do it before. And it's like, uh, I think I, you know, like you, I can, I see, I see this where in the discord, for example, like there's some people who kind of like have come from like have no development backgrounds or nothing, but they do really good work. Like for example, like, um, uh, uh, I, mean, I think I mentioned it earlier, but MG effects are, um, in with, um, his kind of um, he, his transitions workflow that he he basically kind of like uh, he just decided he wants to do that really really well and that because of that he figured out all this kind of stuff and he figured out how to like create like a fairly like complex node pack and all the workflow on top of it and you know um, and just did a really uh, great job of that and I think it's like because he kind of um, he picked something to do you know I think to me that's like a probably a better approach. That's how I learned everything because uh, I, I can't really learn in the traditional sense. It's mostly struggling and trying to do stuff and getting to the, yeah, just learning that way, basically. You need to have a mission or, yeah, that, that's a good point. It's, as you said, it's so vast. So you can do so many things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and as I said, like the last time I counted, it was more than 1,800 notes <laughs> that I've yeah. known of. So it's, just the work of like, what happens if I plug this and this together? What it will do? Like, it's not done. Like, that there's so much to do just to like get yeah. things that already are done and like play with it and, and merge it and like try to combine it. But it, it's a great point to have a, a yeah. focus is essential. Uh, I'm personally a big fan of Animative. Uh, and it's a technology that completely changed the AI video industry. Can you first give a short intro of like what he does for the people that doesn't know and what you like about it, what you do, especially with it mostly and why it's important for the AI scenario? Yeah, well, yeah, basically Animative was like a, a model that was released by a Chinese university around a year ago. And kind of all it does is it, it works um, on top of like stable diffusion, which generates images. And it basically just gives the images generated by stable diffusion, like a sense of motion. So basically it can kind of like um, see 16 frames at a time. And if it, it knows that if you have an image where your head is here, the next one should be just tilted down a bit and then down a bit for it to be like a coherent uh, sense of motion. And um, yeah, basically it kind of like, um, came out around a year ago and basically because um, of the fact that it was built on top of stable diffusion and it could run on like a fairly like small amount of uh, RAM, it was like really exciting for people to build on top of. And it kind of doesn't, it's it's not ideal in many ways. For example, it's still built on top of stable diffusion 1.5, which is kind of um, generates, is trained to generate like 512 by 512 images. So it's kind of like, uh, limited in loads of different ways, you know, in terms of the resolution and the kind of um, the, the sizes that it generates. But but because it has this granular level of control, uh, because of the fact that it was, it was built on top of that model, it means it can plug into this whole ecosystem of all these other models and all these other techniques people have built on top of, say, with the Future 1.5. That, that just means that it's kind of like 
really, really highly controllable. And one way to think about it is that like 16 frames isn't very many frames, you know, but one way to think about it is like what we're actually trying to do is like we're trying to figure out how to kind of like control motion and the Sora approach is kind of like, let's generate like a thousand frames and give you this kind of like level of, um, you know, you could write a prompt and it generates like a thousand frames or like 20 seconds of footage. But then the, the other approach is to basically um, actually like figure out, uh, to kind of like grow with the models, you know, to start from just generating like one frame at a time, which is deform, and then to kind of like jump to larger frame counts, so like to 16 frames, to 32 and to, figure out how to kind of like all the quirks and nuances of working at that level and kind of like grow organically, artistically with those constraints, you know? And to me, it's like, I, I would bet that that approach is probably going to result in better uh, artists and art that the kind of like trying to grab hold of this rocket that's taking off, which is kind of what uh, Sora feels like. It feels like it's kind of like growing with the models and, you know, expanding skills as the constraints lift and, discovering new art styles and every strange of the constraints. So anime diff is like very limited that, you know, 16 frames obviously is a lot, but like people have done so much with it because it was built with the ecosystem and because it kind of like grew with the ecosystem. And I'd hope that like, as this stuff uh, generates, there'll probably be a big difference between open source and closed source. And it'll probably be mostly around the context, lots of details, but probably the, context length, you know, that, you know, Sora can generate like, you know, a huge context length of probably like hundreds of frames. So it can see hundreds of frames at a time, whereas Animative can only see 16. But, you know, that that's kind of like a constraint that kind of uh, allows for creativity. And I hope that like that kind of constraint and other ones like it basically um, enable us to have like this way deeper understanding of how, you know, to use it as, a, as an artistic tool and for all these different you know, art movements to kind of uh, come about as a product of uh, these quirks of usage, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The con constraints are directly connected also with art and with the, the forms as well, like yeah. Yeah, photography, like, for example, right? You before it didn't have it, so it didn't. And then you have the first camera, so it's something new. But on the other hand, you also have the constraints of that camera that every year and every decade will get different in the Photography, the photographer like playing with the constraints and start to create art with that, not just portraits and all of this. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, like thank you, thank you very much for 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 this talk. We are we're getting to the end, but we would like to 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 open the mic for you. So, do you want to share anything, uh, any message or any links? Uh, we'll put your your links on the description later when we post episodes. So yeah, the, the mic's yours, feel free to, to share anything. We really enjoyed the, this conversation with you. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I didn't really know what to say, but uh, one thing I was thinking is that like a lot of the time, um, back in the old days, you know, you could be um, heroic by like going off to war or something, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, where you were like sacrificing something for something that you cared about. But we don't really have a lot of opportunities for that kind of um, heroism these days because we don't have you know that much war and stuff. But I actually think like you know one thing I I I I've been thinking a lot about like genuinely mean it that I actually think the people who um, who kind of like do stuff for open source and who kind of like are especially people that don't really benefit from it um, financially and directly you know to me like you know obviously that's very different to going off to war and sacrificing your life but like. To me, that's like um, heroic in a way, you know, because you're kind of like putting up with all this kind of like struggle, all this kind of like inconvenience, all this difficulty, you know, uh, because of the kind of like belief in an idea or because you kind of like want to make something useful or because you want to do it. I think to me, that's like uh, probably about as heroic as you can get in, in these ages, unless you're kind of... Uh, you know, unfortunate enough to actually like have you know have to face a, a you know a situation that requires heroism in real life, and I think to me those people are all those people are like some of the people I mentioned and many more are kind of like um, heroes in a <laughs> in, in, in as about a real way as is possible, and uh, uh, I'd like to thank all those people and I'm trying to be one of them as much as I can. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think they're kind of like enabling what I, what I really believe will be like the most um, remarkable art scene of this century uh, and it, fe it feels very early and it's very young and things are just starting you know but it feels like it's you know as AI gets better and as how its capabilities improve you know I think they're enabling so many people to 
grow in the right way with uh, AI and to kind of create stuff in the right way. And I think to me, that's kind of, uh, yeah, that's like a heroic thing to do, even though it probably doesn't feel like that when you're debugging issues from <laughs> some rude uh, GitHub commenter. <laughs> Definitely, man, 100%. I think it's, it's like doing the right because it's right and like living a purposeful life, right? Like yeah. having to have something to really give to the world. I, I 100% align with that. Man, thanks thanks a lot for, for, for the talk. It was a big pleasure for us. I'm a big fan of your work and, and everything in Benadoku and the community. And yeah, we always like to finish the podcast with a quote creative quote to let people thinking about it. And lately we are starting to use in ChatGPT to create some quotes and some interesting things start to get in, out of it. Uh, today I asked ChatGPT to create something around why AI open source can help community. And what he came up with is when AI is community driven, creativity knows no bounds. Everyone can innovate, build and share without limits. Nice. All right. Thank you. I will give you one extra today since you were talking about war. So choose wisely the choose wisely the wars you want to fight. Just, you don't need to fight all of them. 